Hello, I'm Kevin, and this talk is going to be about building Kubernetes operators in Rust. And in particular, it's going to be about a crate that I've been working on, which allows you to define the object life cycles using state machines. First, a little bit about myself. I've been a Rust developer for four years. I've been working with Kubernetes for one year. I'm a maintainer on the Crustlet project, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And I'm the lead developer on the Crater Crate, which is the focus of this talk. In this talk, we're going to discuss Crater's unique API for developing operators. I'm going to demo uh, an operator that was built using Crater, and then I'm going to discuss the upcoming features on Crater's roadmap. First, a little bit of background on Crustlet. Crustlet stands for Kubernetes Rust Kubelet, and the goal of the project is to re-implement Kubelet using Rust. And a focus of the project is to allow for the development of Kubelets which support alternative and experimental types of workloads. So the project includes two kubelets, uh, one using the WASI runtime and one using the WASC runtime. And this allows you to deploy WASM applications uh, using a Kubernetes kubelet. So how did I get involved with developing operators? Well, uh, last fall, we wanted to improve the API that was used to define the lifecycle of pods within the Crustlet-based kubelets. And a kubelet is essentially a controller uh, for managing pods. And so uh, we developed this state machine API and uh, I presented it uh, both in a blog post and at KubeCon North America last fall. And we got excellent feedback from the community and there was a huge desire to split out the state machine API to support arbitrary controllers and operators. So that's how Crater was started. Uh, I split that out uh, in December and January, and then uh, Crater was officially launched in a blog post on February 1st. And Crater stands for Kubernetes Rust State Machine Operator. Next, a little bit of prior art. Uh, there's lots of frameworks out there for developing operators. The biggest one is the Operator SDK, which is a CNCF project. It allows developing operators in Go, Ansible, and Helm. The Go uh, variant of this operator SDK uses Go's controller runtime as well as Cube Builder, and it pulls in the Kubernetes types from the main Kubernetes source code, and it offers a lot of plumbing and templating around deploying operators. Uh, the, the Helm variant uh, has a limited subset of functionality, but it allows you to get deploying op your operator very quickly uh, by simply supplying a Helm chart and then the uh, custom resource definition spec contains Helm chart values, which are populated and then applied. And then the operator ensures that the Helm chart uh, stays consistent with cluster state. Uh, some other languages such as Python and, and uh, Ruby, et cetera, uh, all have uh, controller frameworks, which tend to uh, sit on top of the main Kubernetes client library for that language. Uh, these offer limited functionality for controllers. And uh, Rust includes this as well. Uh, the cube and cube runtime crates are both very excellent. Uh, both Crater and Crustlet rely on them uh, under the hood, uh, but cube runtime provides a controller API for Rust. Um, some background on the basic frameworks that I mentioned above. Uh, they typically just watch for, for resources of a specific type. Um, you, you have to uh, sort of explicitly define that watching logic. And then uh, you have methods that you populate for create, update, and delete events uh, for, for your managed resource. Um, and these methods can be uh, end up being quite large and monolithic, um, and it doesn't provide um, a great structure for you to define your operator's logic in. So more sophisticated frameworks like the Go Operator SDK um, do a lot of code generation for you. Um, they wrap uh, the logic of your controller with a lot of boilerplate uh, that is required to build good and reliable controllers. Um, and they offer a very sophisticated API for that. And they have extended features such as the ability to easily add validating or mutating admissions webhooks um, and uh, other extended features, which we'll discuss later. So some common features in all of these frameworks is that there tends to be kind of a single method that you're intended to implement uh, in which you uh, determine the difference between the desired state of the application that's defined in the CRD 
and the existing state of the cluster or, or whatever resources your operator is managing. Um, and these functions tend to be very complex and uh, you're kind of left to your own devices to split up that logic into a reasonable and maintainable piece of code. So the State Machine API was an attempt to uh, increase the reliability of, of implementing this kind of application logic um, and break up uh, these monolithic functions. So uh, the general approach is that for each sort of area of concern uh, that you might have in your application's logic, so an example would be pulling images for pods uh, or mounting volumes, these would be separate areas of concern, you would define a node in your state machine graph um, and you can define an arbitrary state machine graph uh, for your application. Um, these nodes are intended to be uh, infallible and uh, if they do encounter an error they should transition to an explicit error node in the state machine graph uh, which allows better error handling and, and retrying and, and things like that. Um, and then uh, the state handlers, I use uh, the term I use is handlers and that's the actual body of code that's executed within each node in the state machine graph. So uh, this offers some some really great benefits. Um, the first is that uh, the Rust compiler can enforce a lot of uh, nice safety guarantees on the uh, behavior of your operator. Um, so you can ensure that um, the state of your object only ever transitions between states that you've uh, considered and uh, it only transitions to well-defined states. Um, and by using infallible state handlers, we're able to sort of avoid uh, just completely dropping uh, the management of objects and uh, better encode the retry logic uh, that you may want to use with your, your application. Um, and then some other things that you get out of the box. Uh, Crater is able to automatically update the Kubernetes API to reflect the state that you're currently in. Um, it provides the latest version of the object at all times to your state handler. Um, and finally, in Crustlet, we're able to supply a number of common states that you may wish to implement if you're implementing a kubelet specifically. So well, digging a little bit deeper into the Crater API, uh, there's really four major traits that you need to be aware of. Uh, the operator trait, uh, you're intended to implement a type uh, which implements operator, and this is uh, created as a singleton. Um, and this has some associated types on it, namely uh, manifest, initial state, and deleted state. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss the roles of these types a little bit later in the demo. Um, next is the state trait. Uh, this is to be implemented for each state in your state machine graph, so you'll implement this a number of times. Um, and this has methods for uh, defining the status that should be reported to the Kubernetes API uh, when entering this state. And then, of course, the state handler is the, the next function, which returns a indication of which state should be transitioned to or whether the state machine should exit. Uh, the remaining two traits are used to define types that will be uh, provided to your, your state machine, uh, your state handler. So there's object status, uh, that defines the schema of the status that's reported to the Kubernetes API. And then there's object state, uh, which defines the state that is uh, kept, the data that's kept uh, associated with a single state machine or a single uh, object. And then there's an associated type shared state, which represents the data that is shared across all state machines or all objects that your operator is managing. And next, I'd like to walk through a sort of canonical demo uh, that I developed for the original Crater blog post and um, utilizes a lot of the features of Crater's API. So if you'd like to try this demo at home, uh, it is all of the code is located uh, in the examples directory within the Crater subcrate. Uh, within the main Crustlet repository. So uh, if I go into this examples directory, you can see moose.rs, that's the implementation of the operator, and then assets has a number of useful scripts and manifests for playing around with the operator. So just quickly going through uh, the code for moose.rs, um, I use cube, uh, the kubecrates custom resource derived macro to specify uh, the type for my uh, custom resource. Um, and this is great because I just have to specify the contents of the spec field. 
um, and it uh, derives the rest of the type. Uh, but one thing that I'd like to call out is that Crater requires that the status field is used. Uh, that's optional on custom resources, but it's required by Crater. So I uh, name a status type that I've defined below. Uh, this status type gets the first trait implementation uh, from Crater. Uh, there's a method for creating a failed status in the event that Crater has a, an issue within its own runtime and needs to report that the object failed to Kubernetes. And then there's also a method where you should take any information that's captured in your status and produce a JSON patch that will be sent to the Kubernetes API. Uh, next, there's uh, Moose State. Now this is the data that is shared uh, amongst state handlers for a specific object state machine. So it is not shared between objects of a given resource type. Um, there's a trait implementation for this object, uh, which specifies the custom resource type that we defined above, the status type for that resource, and then there is a type for sharing state between objects, which is defined below. And then finally, there's an async drop handler if you run, need to run asynchronous code when the object is deregistered. Looking at the first state implementation, uh, this is the registration state uh, where, where a moose is first created. Um, you have to implement the state trait for each of your states. And uh, here there's a method called status, which simply produces the status type that we defined above for that given state. This is called when the state is entered and uh, should report the status to the API, Kubernetes API for this state. Um, the other method here is the uh, next method. I also refer to this as the state handler, and this is the body of code that's executed for a given state. Uh, it has access to an ARC RW lock uh, to any shared state. Uh, it has access to the state for this specific object, which it has a mutable reference to because that is owned by this object. And then it has access to this manifest type. And this manifest type implements stream, so you can watch for changes to uh, the, the object. Uh, and it also has a method called latest, which supplies the latest copy of the object immediately. Uh, so you can see here, I run some code to, to um, create, uh, register this object in the shared state. Uh, and then I call transition next and uh, tell Crater which state I'd like to transition to. Now, in order to transition to a state, I have to implement transition to and explicitly tag that transition as, as valid with the compiler. Uh, and this is to uh, improve the, the rigor of the state machine implementation and ensure that uh, invalid state transitions are not taken. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on all of these states, uh, but I'd just like to call out that there's a derived macro for, for defining uh, valid transitions. Um, and then I'll just uh, comment on the behavior of this state machine. So uh, the next state is roaming around. Uh, the moose will do that until it gets hungry. Uh, and with some probability, it'll make a friend and update that shared state uh, map. Uh, when it gets hungry, uh, it transitions to the eating state. Uh, this simply waits for some duration and then replenishes the moose's food and then transitions to the sleeping state. Uh, from the sleeping state, uh, we simply wait 20 seconds and then transition back to roaming. And then the final state is a uh, deleted or, or deregistration state. Uh, this is a state that on an operator uh, like a kubelet, uh, you may transition to within uh, the handlers of other, other states in your state machine graph. So a pod may be running and then it exits and it's successful and you transition to the completed state and that exits the state machine. Uh, or in the case of this operator, uh, I never explicitly transition to it and the state machine simply runs forever. However, uh, when an object is deleted with the Kubernetes API, Crater needs to transition to a state that allows the object to clean up and then exit. And so uh, this state needs to exist uh, for Crater to transition to. It will interrupt the execution of the state machine, transition to this state, and then uh, execute from this state uh, until the state machine exits. And you can see that this state calls transition complete, which uh, completes and, and uh, terminates the, the execution of the state machine, and then it returns a result uh, which indicates whether the state machine exited gracefully or not. For our shared state, I have a simple hash map of relationships between mooses, uh, and then I implement uh, moose tracker. Uh, this is the um, uh, type that will implement op our operator trait, uh, and these are 
created essentially as singletons. Uh, so scrolling down, uh, this is the implementation of the operator trait. I again reference the status and uh, resource uh, type definitions from above. I indicate that the tag state is the first state that should be entered when an object state machine is created. I indicate that the release state is that, that state that should be transitioned to when an object is deleted. And finally, I reference the uh, state type that is, is um, specific to each object. There's a couple of methods that need to be implemented. So the first is to uh, create that initial state type uh, for a given object uh, when the state machine is starting. And this can reference the manifest of that object or any shared state on the operator. Next is uh, Crater needs to be able to fetch a arc RW lock reference to the shared state so that it can supply it to the state handlers. And so there's a method that you need to implement here to simply uh, you know, create an, a clone of that, that arc and return it to Crater. And then finally, uh, I've been working on some extended functionality to support uh, admissions uh, validating and mutating webhooks. And here, uh, it's hidden behind a compiler feature flag, but essentially you get a copy of the uh, object that's, that's trying to be um, changed or deleted or created. Uh, and of course, you can reference any shared state on the operator uh, if you want, need to validate within sort of the context of all of the objects that the operator is managing. Uh, and then here, I'm simply validating that the Moose's name starts with the letter M, and then I can uh, allow the object or the, the change to, to occur, and then I can optionally mutate the object. Here, I'm, I'm leaving it unmutated. Uh, or I can deny the object and uh, return kind of a standard Kubernetes status, which indicates why this has been denied, and that'll be returned by the Kubernetes, op uh, Kubernetes API to the client. So scrolling down a little bit, uh, this final piece of code is uh, our main function and it's all you need to do to actually start an operator with Crater. So I create a cube config, which I simply infer. Uh, I create my operator singleton and then I call operator runtime new and uh, pass it that cube config and that uh, operator singleton. And then I op can optionally supply list parameters to filter uh, the objects that I'm managing. And then finally I call runtime start dot await and that'll block forever uh, and it will uh, spawn asynchronous tasks uh, for the execution of the state machines for each object that's created. So if I exit out of this and uh, I come up and rerun uh, my operator, uh, you can see that I am setting uh, the Moose module as well as all of Crater to debug uh, for the purposes of this demo. And I'm, I'm also activating the admissions webhook so that I can show you that. So if I run this, it'll, um, I'm in the wrong directory. There we go. Uh, it'll print out the CRD here, um, but it, it doesn't actually apply it. Um, the CRD is located in the assets directory uh, within the examples folder. So you can apply this uh, yourself if you wanna play around. Um, but you can see here that there was already a moose registered with the API. So we got a resync event uh, when we started watching for mooses. Um, we created an event handler here that's creating a state machine for this, this moose. Um, let me scroll up. And uh, there's a number of, of uh, pieces of logging here and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but initially the moose enters the tag state, uh, and there is a status update that's patched, uh, excuse me, th there's a status update that's patched to Kubernetes when it enters this state. Uh, and then next it transitions to the roaming state and there's a status update for that. And then the moose will continue to move, uh, through its states, uh, as the operator progresses. So here in canines, uh, you can see uh, I can list uh, mooses and I have set uh, certain fields on the status to be printed out uh, when you use kubectl. Um, and so we can see the moose transitioning through the states. Uh, for the purposes of this demo, I can uh, generate uh, a large number of mooses. So here I generate 25 new mooses and uh, the 
amount of time that the moose spends in the roaming state uh, is determined by its body weight. That, that determines how long it takes to get hungry, and, and the body weight is sampled from a normal distribution. So uh, the mooses should go through the state machine at different rates, which, which makes it a little bit more interesting. Um, and then finally, I can demonstrate the, uh, the webhook capability. So I have a moose here uh, named George, which is an invalid name, uh, according to my rule. And so I can apply this uh, manifest and you can see uh, in the log that the request was denied. Uh, that went by quickly. Um, but you can also see that the response returned to the client is uh, that this is a uh, invalid moose name. So um, hopefully this has been a, a nice overview of the API and uh, the functionality that you can implement fairly concisely uh, using the Crater API. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about some new functionality I've been working on with Crestlet and Crater. Uh, the first is that both crates have transitioned to using tracing for all logging events that we emit. And this offers full compatibility with the original log crate that we were using, so it shouldn't require any changes uh, for uh, consumers of our crate. Uh, additionally, I've been working on some extended functionality for Crater. So uh, wherever uh, log events were emitted, where we were populating strings with the value of variables, uh, those have been pulled out into structured fields, uh, which should allow you to dissect uh, the log output of Crater using a, a tool like JQ for JSON parsing. Um, and then I've added several key spans to uh, the tracing instrumentation in Crater, uh, namely, whenever an admission webhook request is processed, whenever a single state uh, node is executed for an object, and then whenever an update is received from the Kubernetes API uh, and is processed. And if you'd like to read a little bit more about tracing, uh, Luca Palmieri has an excellent uh, blog post slash uh, book on deploying Rust in cloud native environments and, and has an entire section on tracing that's, that's really excellent. Uh, finally, I'd like to talk about uh, Crater's roadmap a little bit. So uh, on, in the near term, I'd like to expand the ability to uh, easily subscribe to uh, watching different types of Kubernetes resources. And I have an RFC out on GitHub for the API proposal there. Uh, in addition to that, I'd like to think a little bit about how the state machine API can be improved to uh, sort of identify where cluster state may be deviating from desired state and uh, how to trigger reconciliation within the context of a state machine. Uh, finally, I'd like to expand the templating and um, sort of uh, boilerplate generation surrounding uh, creating and deploying operators. This is something that's offered by the Go SDK, and uh, I think there's a lot of room for improvement here with Crater. And then I'd like to look at the operator SDK's capabilities roadmap for ways that I can uh, offer very simple APIs to implement some of the more advanced features such as auto scaling and abnormal state detection. So thank you for coming to my talk. I hope this has been very interesting and I hope you'll check out Crater. Uh, if you'd like to get in contact with me or the Crustlet project, you can find us on Twitter, uh, GitHub. Uh, we both have websites. And then finally for the Crustlet project, uh, there's a hashtag Crustlet Slack channel in the Kubernetes uh, Slack. So uh, that's probably the, the easiest way to reach out to us. Thank you.